Hello, good evening, everyone. I see we're still waiting for, for a few people to join us for the webinar tonight. Um, I guess in the meantime, uh, we can have a go, we can have a start. Um, so thank you very much for joining us uh, at tonight's uh, webinar, um, Insights into the Evolution of Business and Government in China, hosted by the Confucius Institute for Business at um, LSE. Um, my name is Martina and I'm here tonight to represent the Confucius Institute for Business, for which I work for as a marketing and sales manager. Um, so before we start with the actual webinar, uh, let me just start to say a couple of words um, about the Institute. Um, so our Institute has been um, launched back in 2006 and it's a partnership uh, between LSE, Tsinghua University and Hanban. It's been uh, funded by five sponsoring companies, uh, which are HSBC, BP, Deloitte, Wire, and Standard Chartered. Um, our main um, aim here at the Confucius Institute is, um, you know, helping uh, London businesses to foster their understanding of doing business uh, with China and understanding their business culture uh, in China. In fact, uh, we are actually the first um, Confucius Institute in the world to specialize uh, in business. Um, we do this through a variety of courses, uh, such as intercultural communication trainings, uh, free public lectures, usually hosted at LSE, and um, our executive program um, called Chinese Language and Culture for Business. So if you're interested in you know, um, getting to know more about our courses and uh, getting involved in our free public lectures events, um, you should see uh, in the group chats uh, our, um, our website and our LinkedIn page. Um, so today we are um, here as we usually host uh, public lectures um, at LSE. Unfortunately, due to the current circumstances, um, we have to move this online. Um, so usually these sessions are called uh, China Business Briefings and are usually uh, chaired by Professor Ken Dan, which is who is um, a professor of economic history at LSC and has been working with Sibol, with the Confucius Institute for, for a very long time. So I'm very happy um, today to, to have him here on this new uh, version of our um, China Business Briefing, which is going to be an online webinar. Um, so without further ado now, I will pass it on Professor Dan, who will be uh, conducting and chairing uh, our webinar uh, introducing our guest speaker, Paul Dupont. So I will leave it up to you, Professor Dan. Good. Can you hear me? Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Professor Dan. We cannot see you. Maybe you can put your video on as well. Okay, certainly. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah? All right. Um, thank you all for um, joining in this uh, first webinar. I quite like this uh, uh, webinar uh, world and the new world. So um, ever since last, um, Business briefing, uh, we had uh, quite a difficult time uh, during this lockdown. Now, uh, although the lockdown is largely re relaxed, it is still safer for us to do this online. So my, my view is this, um, the virus doesn't have uh, any brain and any legs, so we can beat the virus. So, um, now today, we're so pleased to have this uh, first webinar with Mr. Paul Dupont. I think this, you know, this is an interesting name. This is certainly not uh, British. I, I, I hope I'm right, <laughs> it sounds, uh, sounds French. Um, so um, Paul has a, a very distinguished and a long experience with China. This is the right timing for him to give us his view about doing business with China. Paul, it's all yours. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's good to be talking today. I guess you can hear me and you can see me. Yes, I can. Uh, yeah. Perfect. In that case, I shall uh, share my screen as well uh, so that you don't just see my lockdown hair. Cool. So is my screen up there? Correct, yes. Okay, cool. So I shall uh, get started. Um, 
Okay, so uh, firstly, uh, thank you everybody for joining uh, this um, talk that I uh, am going to give on essentially on business and the, the relationship between business and government in China, how that's changed and how it's um, uh, evolved over the last few years. Um, uh, I appreciate um, everybody joining online. It's, it's, it's a little more difficult when I can't see people's eyes and see which particular um, kind of topics are, are more interesting so I can go into more detail. So um, please, at the end, if you have questions, uh, you can ask them then and I'll be happy to go into more detail. Um, cool. So uh, let me get started. So uh, firstly, just to give you a very quick background. So uh, yeah, I'm Paul. Um, I have been doing kind of market entry sales and advisory work in and around China for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, a lot of that time was spent with Intralink, which is uh, a boutique consultancy doing market entry uh, and advisory work in China. Also um, for the New Zealand government with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs advising them on uh, China's industrial policy. And now more recently, I'm, uh, I'm kind of just in, involved in, uh, in, in selling technology at a startup to uh, companies uh, across Asia. Um, but over, over those 10 years, I've, I've worked with uh, probably around 30 different clients in, in a range of different sectors and written, uh, I don't know how many reports anymore on, on different aspects of it. Um, and, and, and actually one of the, mo the, the aspects of this I find the most interesting is uh, around um, enterprise in China, how that's changed and, and, and uh, what kind of mechanisms the government uses to, uh, to, to make that evolve. So I'm going to start um, kind of this conversation by taking a look at two different pictures. Um, the first is uh, kind of how we see China today, right? When you go there on your business trip in 2018, um, you could see everything that's fantastic and high tech uh, right here. Uh, you know, when you go to the go to the railway station, you see these fantastic uh, trains that have been built. It's kind of um, uh, by state-owned enterprises using uh, the highest, uh, both foreign and Chinese technology that, that carry people at high speed around the country, right? So this is, you know, this is China in 2018. And I think it's, it's really important to highlight, um, in fact, China in 2019, uh, this is still what you can see in different parts of the world, in parts of China, right? So there are still actual steam trains that, um, are carrying coal from uh, coal mines to steel mills. Um, and and this, is, this train was actually built in, I believe in 99, as in 1999, um, carrying, carrying coal to the steel mills and it's still in active use until the end of the year uh, in Western China. And, you know, I think what this, this kind of describes is, um, you know, the, these are two businesses operating these trains. And we can see on the left, um, that there is a whole ton of fantastic uh, innovation technology in China that is really driving forwards. But, you know, the reality is it isn't the whole country that is at that level yet. And there is still a lot of progress, improvement to go before, um, uh, you know, before, before the, the country can really justifiably say it's, it's, it's achieved um, uh, the, the, the highest levels of, you know, modernization. Um, and so, Really, I think what these questions bring about is, is kind of a key question, which is um, a little bit inflammatory in the way I phrased it, but how will uh, China build a world-beating economy? Uh, how will it get the whole country up to the same level as its, uh, you know, essentially world-beating uh, railway, you know, high-tech train performance? Um, and so to do that, I kind of want to start the talk by going into a little bit of history um about uh the, the the you know business in china over the last sort of 50 60 years which i will keep at very high level because we only have uh 30 to 45 minutes before uh, i go into kind of the more modern uh era and um specifically how uh you know i've seen innovation happen what are the key drivers of of, of innovation in terms of building that economy uh, and then a little bit about the specific tools that the government uses. And, and then finally, we'll, we'll look at the policies and how this impacts not just Chinese companies, but also uh, foreign companies trying to engage with China as well. Um, and kind of which sectors are the most interesting and, and which uh, maybe less so as well. Mm. Cool. So, um, oh, and of course, to begin with, right, 
we've got to look at what are China's objectives uh, themselves, right? So uh, in 2015, China is very handy. The, the government very conveniently puts out its economic objectives every five years. So you don't need to look at the newspaper to, to find out, you know, how they're going to be domin dominating the world today. You can just go look at their policy and, um, and you, can, you can see that in 2015, they put out their key objectives, uh, firstly, to innovate uh, and bring the productivity of, of, of capital and assets within the country up to a much higher level, predominantly through abandoning heavy industry and using more internet technology. Secondly, it's about maintaining social stability around the country uh, and balancing growth in different areas, urban and rural, uh, east and west, across the country and then finally um, it's it's about uh, having a sustainable economy um, which you know any 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 trip to, to China over the last 10 years and you'll see that a lot of the development that's happened is is not sustainable um, and so it's no surprise that going green is, is really a key part of that um, so yeah so quick history lesson uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on this uh, because we'll be here all night but um, this is kind of how enterprise and business has changed since the 50s. Of course, in the 50s uh, or late 40s, the party rose to power, um, abolished private business, consolidated business into ministries, right? And, and this period sort of lasted for 20, 30 years. And those 20, 30 years can really be um, described uh, in, in very broad strokes as, uh, the, as, as the government mobilizing as much uh, capital as it can into specific um, into specific sectors and and driving output in those sectors so it's all about getting economies of scale in in these particular sectors um, and then as time went on through the 60s 70s uh, uh, definitely the the 80s um, there were the uh, you know the opening up uh, reforms of, of the economy in which not just mobilizing capital, but also um, uh, providing social stability um, are, are kind of are become priorities. So ensuring that um, society is, you know, that the people are looked after uh, and that they have, um, you know, enough food to eat, right? Which, which was a concern. And then kind of as, as the 80s, 90s progresses becomes less of a concern. Um, and it's in the 80s that firstly we see uh, the opening up to the outside through the special economic zones in Shenzhen, uh, which bring foreign exchange in. Late 80s, um, when privatization starts and state-owned enterprises are, um, well, late 70s, late 80s, this is when state-owned enterprises come about. Um, and then 90s, what we see is instead kind of kind of a, a shift in priority from the state instead of controlling all aspects of business um there's this policy uh released by the uh by the by the, the, the party which uh prioritizes the control of certain nationally strategic sectors right so the sectors oil food security uh communications this kind of thing where um, it's absolutely critical that, that you know, the state believes it's absolutely critical that they control, you know, defined as the commanding heights, whereas other areas of the economy which were very controlled by the central government are kind of released into, um, firstly, into state-owned enterprise, which is not directly managed by the state, uh, but managed independently and also privately. So, you know, that could uh, be, um, for example, retailers or... Um, the, uh, the, the, the automotive industry, um, parts of the economy like that. Um, and then of course, as that progresses, right, so strategic control, we see through the 2000s, um, an incredible boom in, uh, in, in, in an economic boom across the country, um, which uh, you know, started by the urban housing privatization in the late 90s, uh, accelerated by the accession to the WTO, um, and then uh, we see uh, the great financial crisis in, in 2008 um, causes, I think it's around half a trillion dollars worth of financial stimulus to be pumped in from the central authorities to uh, state-owned enterprises and into the rest of the economy. And this kind of, um, uh, this, this, this relaxing of the rules and this stimulus 
creates um, not only fantastic infrastructure around the country, but also uh, huge overcapacity and inefficiencies and corruption uh, within the state. Um, and, and so the 2010 period onwards has been about kind of balancing those two things, balancing growth with, um, with, with reducing corruption and uh, improving productivity. So kind of at the end, uh, you know, where we are today, uh, we're in a position with um, uh, government policies that are very much around boosting productivity, but also ensuring that, you know, these three previous um, uh, kind of trends are maintained as well. Um, cool, so that's the history. I've gone through that as fast as I possibly can. Um, now I kind of want to talk about uh, right now, what tools does the government, or kind of what, what, not what tools the government has, but what vehicles there are in the country to continually drive growth in line with those objectives that we saw um, the, uh, you know, the government uh, putting out in its, in its five-year plans. And so we see essentially two key vehicles. Um, so state-owned enterprise and then um, a privately owned enterprise. I've, I've called it POE for the sake of convenience, but uh, I think that's just a word I've made up. Um, so we see state-owned enterprise, right? Um, I, 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 this is, these are companies which uh, are you know, mandated by the state. They've been given all of the uh, wonderful benefits that the government could possibly give them. They control key industries that will have demand in perpetuity. Um, they have uh, limited competition within those industries, definitely not zero competition. There, there is competition within industries, within between state-owned enterprises, and they have to fight for their business in some situations, uh, but definitely a softer competition compared to the private uh, market. Uh, these companies, they get access to cheap capital via loans to go off and do whatever they want. They have reduced regulation when it comes to listing on public markets. Their management are all the most senior political figures there are in the country. And they have priority when it comes to global connections, right? We compare this with privately owned companies, which are limited to operate in certain industries only. Uh, they only have access to expensive, you know, relatively expensive capital via loans. If they do want to list on the stock market, uh, they have a whole bunch of hurdles to jump through. Um, so typically rely on kind of venture cap funding in order to, to grow. Um, they have to deal with a whole load of oversight from the authorities in terms of, um, you know, managing data or managing uh, policies within the company. And uh, they also are given quite a lot of restrictions on doing business with foreign companies. And, uh, and kind of when you look at this, right, so, so, when you look at the state of enterprise, they have all these advantages and yet um, they're still not innovating in even close to the levels of, of you know, uh, productivity from innovation that privately owned companies within the country are getting. Their, their business is still predominantly investment led, right? It's not consumption led, it's, it's, it's big infrastructure projects that see 20, 30 years before they get a return. They have huge mountains of unproductive debt, not necessarily their fault, but you know there there is all this debt out there that that they they own, and as time goes on, in fact, it's already started since 2016. Um, you know uh, these companies in efficiency drives uh, are making millions of of staff redundant right uh, across the country, um, particularly in the most traditional sectors up in kind of northeast China in Dongbei, um, where you see uh, you know in the coal sector. Uh, like hundreds of thousands of people laid off in, in a single go. Compare that again with the privately owned industry, uh, privately owned sector, which has all of these restrictions, and yet you'll see they're creating 90% of the, the jobs in the country uh, each year. Um, not necessarily the best jobs uh, by any means, you know, I'm, I'm not going into the quality of the job, but, but they're the ones creating the jobs. Um, they're generating 60% of GDP, and you know, out of these companies, we're getting some of the best innovation there is um, globally, right? Uh, you look at Alibaba, you look at Tencent, you look at ByteDance. Um, you know, you can look at a lot of these software hardware companies, um, and you can see some really cool uh, products innovation coming out, uh, especially when you compare that to state-owned enterprise. So, you know, what's going on, right? Um, why? 
why is this happening um, uh, to start with? What can the government do to ensure that this innovation is spread out throughout the country uh, more liberally, uh, more fairly? And, uh, and, and, and essentially, what is driving innovation? Now, what's driving innovation is, is a pretty broad uh, question, and it's kind of out of, like, in its completeness, is outside of the scope of this talk. But um, what I can do now is kind of give you a couple of examples of um, what I've seen, uh, you know, through, through, through projects that I've done in China um, in terms of how I saw innovation being driven. Uh, and I think they give uh, quite a nice overview um, of, of what's happening. So uh, to begin with, um, I want to look at, well, I've written automotive sector, but, but really what I mean is um, kind of the whole transport automotive sector that is around uh, ride hailing. So uh, back in 2007 or so, uh, while I was at Interlink, we were hired by a large uh, Japanese uh, automotive um, brand who were trying to understand in more detail um, what impact is the firstly what impact is uh, the internet ride hailing car sharing this kind of technology having on uh, the uh, on, on, on China as a whole uh, what are the opportunities arising from that and then also how do electric vehicles fit into that? Um, and what kind of electric vehicles is, is the market hankering, right? And, and I think probably you know, after going out and visiting uh, uh, loads of different uh, companies, private, privately held companies like Didi or taxi companies or uh, other automotive OEMs or government officials, um, really it was, it was Didi that, that stood out uh, as, as quite an exceptional uh, firm. And the problems they've had to face, I think, are very illustrative of, um, of the potential of innovation as well as how the government needs to manage innovation um, in order to, to maintain, kind of strike a balance right, uh, between various stakeholders in the industry. So, uh, so, so if you look at DD, right, I'm sure everybody in this talk is familiar with DD. Uh, they're basically China's competitor to, or China's answer to, to Uber. Um, in fact, acquired uh, Chinese operations for Uber back in 2016, I believe, um, in, in, in an equity swap. So DD started in 2012. They rose to, um, they, they started by connecting um the connecting uh, essentially the general population people with a mobile app with the dd mobile app to empty taxis right at this point it was just empty taxis we're not talking about private cars like uber does so they started by uh by offering uh in beijing um the ability for uh, a passenger or somebody on the street to be able to hail a taxi through their phone um which if if anybody can remember doing you know going to beijing and trying to hail a taxi back in the 2010 onwards uh you'll remember this is a quite an amazing uh development right so they came in they they brought this idea and uh, pretty much revolutionized the transport sector uh in china you know the, the last mile transport sector uh, between you know, uh, uh, between getting people into taxis and then getting them home, um, it, taxis are very much a state-run business. Um, they're either managed directly by a regional government or through a trade union. Uh, there is a very limited number of, of, of taxis. You know, very similar to New York uh, in, in every city. And you know, just, just to give you an illustration: um, in 2003 to 2012 uh, in Beijing. 2003, there were 65,000 taxis. 2012, there were 66,000 taxis, right? Just to give you the kind of idea of how important um, having more cars or more flexibility in the way that the matchmaking is done uh, could impact the city. 
So they started, they started by, by doing this. Um, in 2014, the, the new CEO joins uh, from Goldman Sachs and uh, she uh, starts opening DD up more to private drivers. So this is kind of, you know, in a sense, almost illegal. I believe it probably is illegal. Um, of hiring private drivers to uh, ferry people from A to B instead of using the taxis. And what this does is, is it then upsets the, uh, completely upsets the urban migration patterns that are happening uh, within China. It, it, it gives opportunities to, um, to people who were living either in the countryside or had kind of poorly paid jobs in the city. Uh, to come and have you know relatively glamorous jobs driving cars around uh, driving cars and meeting people talking to passengers um, uh, you know whole opportunities with a stable income without having to go through the trade union and get their taxi permits um, and and so you know this this is this is upsetting for example in Beijing you know this is this is then upsets uh, the Hubei you know the, the the surrounding province this upsets the Hubei regional government who hang on um, you know, all of our uh, men are leaving to go and work in the in the taxis in Beijing, and then people in Beijing are all of a sudden getting uh, all of these uh, rural migrants coming in to, to to drive cars, pushing up rents and 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 taking resources. So you've got kind of like a migration issue as well. And then um, and then kind of in a later phase, so sort of this is particularly relevant to the work we were doing with the Japanese OEM. Um, Didi, yes, astoundingly. Uh, operates or, or is, 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 is kind of um, managing the operation of 3%, I think it was maybe 2018, 2019, probably more now, 3% of all the cars on the road are being uh, are on the DD platform. So if you think, of the, you know, I think in China, uh, typically each year they sell between 25, 28 million cars per year, right? Like how many cars on the road are, 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 um, are, are there for Didi. Um, and, and their goal, um, Didi's goal is to get that up to 10% of the cars on the road. So now you've got this private company that can go to all these big state-owned automotive manufacturers or even foreign manufacturers and say, hey, I don't like the tires on your car. I want uh, better tires. I want tires that, that reduce the noise or hey, um, I, I want my taxis to be safer. So uh, my next Volkswagen, I want it to have a glass screen separating um, either the driver from the passenger or the passengers from each other. Um, and so now you've got this company that essentially started from nothing dictating uh, to these giant uh, automotive OEMs or um, to, to the government uh, itself, how to manage its transport policy, its migration policy, its uh, automotive design process. You're the government, how do you manage this, right? Um, on one hand, this is fantastic uh, because you, you, you're solving a problem that desperately needed solving and, and they've done this without even um, having to upset the taxi companies to begin with, which are a powerful kind of sector, or at least were a powerful sector um, in, in, in China. Uh, and it is important to remember that China is not a monolith. The state can't just snap its fingers and things happen, right? There are many different players, many different stakeholders that the government has to negotiate with and balance with in order to, to make things happen. So, so the government has on the one hand this fantastic product, um, which has been replicated by many different startups, not just Didi, but uh, in, in many different kind of internet connected sectors. And it has to balance that with the demands of regional governments uh, and with uh, automotive companies. So, what drives innovation in this case? It's um, firstly, it's, it's these private companies solving problems. And then it's the government and the um, state owned companies kind of adapting to, to, to manage that. Uh, yeah, absolutely kind of fascinating. Then a slightly more prosaic um, example of, of uh, one of my favorite examples of, of how innovation happens in China and kind of anybody who's hung out with me for more than 20 minutes and talked about China with me um, will, will have heard, uh, you know, one of these stories about um, the laundry industry in China. Uh, so again, when I, while I was with Interlink, we, we were representing um, a manufacturer of internet connected laundry management systems uh, from France that uh, was looking to crack the market in China 
and sell uh, its its laundry management systems to uh, you know these uh, frankly mega laundries right around China that, that that handle hundreds of hotels. The laundry industry is one of those uh, bizarre uh, sectors that is incredibly um, fragmented, geographically fragmented, uh, and also relatively uh, low tech. It's um, because it's it's largely a privately run uh, industry, um, it, it means it doesn't have easy access to capital um, uh, or even, you know, venture capital funds without a good reason, right? So in order to consolidate the laundry industry in China, which desperately needs to happen, um, in order to kind of improve the environmental standards, improve the efficiency, uh, the, logis the, sorry, the logistics, you know, all the stuff around the laundry industry, um, there needs to be kind of a way of justifying that valuation in order to, 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 to start on kind of a spending spree and acquire lots of different um, companies. And so, uh, so, so while, you know, while we were doing this project over the course of, um, I guess, a magical couple of years, I went and visited probably 20 or 30 different um, laundries around China, I made friends with all the all, all, all the, the laundry bosses and, uh, and and the National Laundry Association, and and at one point was invited to this wonderful um, uh, event that was organised in uh, Dalian up in the northeast, uh, which is uh, the the Chinese Laundry Association IOT uh, conference, and uh, unfortunately this is the highest res image I could find, but you can see I'm somewhere up here, um, and then this is this is the movers and shakers of, of, of China's laundry industry. Uh, and the most remarkable part of this was at this conference, um, it, was, uh, it was very traditional, low-tech um, companies from around China coming together to meet these uh, young startups with all kinds of cool software, internet-connected systems uh, to improve the... Uh, to, to, to improve the management of laundries. And there is down here, I don't know if you can see him, but just down here, um, there is this, this chap who's, uh, I guess, about 24. Um, he's the founder of this company called Idaisi. Idaisi uh, takes laundry. So, so you as a user in your home, you can't be bothered to do your own laundry or you don't have a washing machine. You put your laundry into a bag, you leave it out your door, you tap a button in an app, somebody comes along, picks it up, takes it to a laundry, gives it back to you the next day, clean, pressed, you know, folded, uh, ready to wear. And he's just the software platform that, that he's built. And then at this conference, I've never seen kind of so many, uh, you know, I hate to use the word, but grizzled, um, if, you know, laundry bosses crowding around this, this young guy desperate to, to, to get onto his platform because they know that if they can uh, use, um, if, they, if they can get their, their, their laundries onto the platform, it gives them um, firstly the bragging rights to say, you know, we're, we're an internet connected company. Um, but more than that, you know, more than just the access to the new market of all these consumers, it means that they can say, because we're an internet con connected company, we can go to government backed venture capital funds, um, which have KPIs to meet uh, based on innovation, based on environmental impact. And they can say, well, hey, look, um, we're doing all this cool stuff. And with that, um, uh, you can invest in us and then we can consolidate the market, right? So, you know, how, how is this driving innovation? You know, for me, it's, um, it's very much, uh, uh, you know, even the most traditional sectors, uh, in the economy are, 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 are riding on the backs of these new cool companies coming through. And you know, th this is taking the steam train of the laundry industry that we saw earlier um, and, and, and turning it into that high speed, you know, connected system. Uh, you know, same with Didi and the, the steam train of the taxis uh, to kind of overuse a metaphor slightly. Um, cool, so we know all this and we've seen these, these, these cool examples. Um, and I realize I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to speed up a little. Uh, but how do how do we how does the government build better 
state-owned enterprise? Um, how does it build better enterprise generally based on, based on you know, what we've seen uh, just now? So first, I think it's important just to take a very quick look, and I will go through this very quickly, uh, of the, the tools that the government has and it's to, to, to manage this. And it's important to kind of separate the party from the government. Um, and, and a kind of a nice comparison of this is the party is like um, the Conservative Party in the UK, whereas the government is like uh, the civil service. They have different uh, ways of doing things. The party has most importantly access to the organizational or controls the organizational department, which I thoroughly recommend if you don't know about reading a book called, I think it's called The Party by Richard McGregor, um, which goes into how the organization department works. It's super interesting, but essentially it's an enormous human resources department for the government or for the party. And through this, they appoint all of the most senior leaders in the government, all the most senior business leaders, the CEOs of the companies, and also, you know, the chairs of, um, of, of universities. Uh, the, the party also controls trade unions, and it also has these committees, which act as kind of two-way conduits into private companies as well as state-owned companies. So with party committees that you read about in newspapers that are embedded into a private company in China, not only can they kind of uh, make their policies known in those companies, but they can also take management techniques um, up back into the party, which they can then spread and train uh, state-owned enterprise executives with. Then if we look at government, government has very much a harder, um, more hands-on approach to, to managing uh, the enterprise. So it has SASAC, which is the single entity that controls the majority of state-owned enterprise in China. Um, and that's accountable directly to the government. And that's where you find state hold, you know, that's, that's, that's the entity that owns state-owned enterprise. Um, the government also has investment companies, which uh, like China Investment Corporation, which manages most of the banks and insurers in the country. And then it also has the ministries, which are regulate policy, uh, put out new policies like uh, anybody who's in technology will be aware of MIIT, which is a really important ministry if you're a foreigner trying to get into China that, that you need to go and talk to and make friends with. Um, and they also control the industry associations. So these are the tools that the government has to improve business enterprise. So how is it going to do it? Um, so these are the policies that um, are probably the most important. That are, they're likely to change next year with the, the 14th, 5th year plan that's to be released. But these are kind of the key policies that, that, that exist right now. And number one, most important uh, since 2012 is, is getting rid of corruption in the country. That's the number one kind of drain on productivity. And also um, the number one reason that small companies prior to 2012 uh, struggle to compete with larger companies because they just didn't have the means to compete on a corruption basis within, within the country. And, and reducing this corruption level uh, really helps both uh, smaller companies in China and foreign companies in China um, uh, participate. And I think it's really important to say that as a foreign company going to China, you don't have to engage in corruption at all. Not once did I have to, uh, was I asked even to, to, to engage in any kind of activity. It's um, not required whatsoever. Secondly, um, is the government's heavy, heavy um, uh, emphasis or, uh, to, to deleverage state-run companies, to reduce the amount of debt, particularly unproductive debt. Um, so I, I'm not a finance guy particularly, so I'm probably not the best person to ask questions about this, but um, essentially it's, it's, it's finding ways to offload all of the unproductive debt that these state and enterprises have built up. Um, and uh, also introducing a certain amount of private ownership uh, not controlling ownership, but private ownership to improve uh, transparency and to um, uh, ensure that the valuation of state-owned companies is kept kind of in check. And then finally, new bankruptcy laws that, that um, help clear the market of uh, unproductive state-owned enterprise, um, which apparently have come, but you know, I've yet to see evidence kind of, of that actually happen. China is also looking to, you know, through this Belt and Road Initiative to reach out globally um, and, and, and take its national champions uh, abroad. Uh, I think there's a lot of negative press around Belt and Road uh, that, that I'm not going to go into now, but I think it's important to kind of consider that the, the main goal, I believe, is to, um, 
to, to find uses of China's overcapacity and also to build bridges, um, if metaphorically and literally, uh, with, with other countries. Um, domestic productivity is also absolutely core to this, uh, a, a really a key policy made in China 2025, um, which I'd be happy to talk about as well afterwards if anybody's interested, uh, is key to uh, bringing domestic companies that operate those steam trains up to the level of uh, China's, you know, uh, real champions. And Made in China 2025, again, gets a lot of negative press, especially abroad. But I think it's important that, you know, when I went to visit uh, one of these um, big Chinese OEMs, uh, automotive OEMs, it, they made a big point that, that, you know, Made in China 2025 is about getting to Industry 4.0, um, which I'm sure everybody's aware of, when, when in fact most of the SOEs in China haven't even got to, you know, made in, uh, to, to Industry 2.0, right? Um, and, and, and so I, I think, you know, whilst some aspects that made in China 2025, uh, I think um, parts of the West are right to, to, to be a bit concerned about, a lot of it really is, is, is just about bringing up um, uh, industry up to kind of um, to, to, to the level of those high speed trains. Um, improving human resources. So as we saw through the CPC committees or through the organization department, um, the, 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 the Communist Party is linking career progress to the ability to innovate, right? So um, politicians who can demonstrate innovation or business leaders who can demonstrate innovation, they're the ones who are getting promoted. And they're the ones also learning from privately run companies. Um, and finally, uh, I'll make a quick point about this in a moment, but on, on going green and, and economic growth being ecologically sustainable. Um, you know, the risks, I've, I've gone over some of these, but the risks of some of these policies, you know, as we're seeing right now, um, is an alienation between China and the rest, which is kind of a bit sad to see. Um, potentially justified, I'm, I'm, you know, it's kind of out of the scope of this topic, but, um, uh, you know, for me personally, it's kind of sad to see. Uh, definitely there is a risk of, instead of keeping foreign companies out, as is quite frequently argued in, in, in newspapers, uh, there is also the impact that, um, uh, really, really innovative uh, domestic, privately owned companies in China are kind of trapped in China uh, due to regulatory concerns, and 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 struggle to, um, to to be able to expand abroad, which is you know a big shame because there's a lot of value that, that these companies can can bring abroad. Um, there are uh, yeah, so uh, continually not opening up to market forces will create inefficiencies, but you know that's a choice that the, the party continues to make. Um, privately owned enterprise uh, compete as well continuously in, in a very unsustainable fashion a lot of the time. So if you look at um, um, if you look at for example the, the the shared bike initiatives in China, you can see that uh, what could be a really great um, development of, of this new technology over time turns into uh, you know a, a one company uh, like like a network effect where only one company could come out uh, producing all kinds of unintended consequences um, and then lastly is um, the, the creation of accidental monopolies a particularly good example of that is um, Li Keqiang went along to a company called Tisco Group back in 2015 told them or told the greater steel community that you know even though we're the, the biggest manufacturer of steel in the country um uh, you still can't produce the steel that goes into a ballpoint pen so tisco went away for two years created uh, the steel that's good enough for the ballpoint pen and essentially replaced the foreign og oligopoly that was delivering this steel by one single chinese state-owned company so effectively kind of you know out of the frying pan and into the fire or however that uh, expression goes. Um, I apologize for going so quickly through that, but I realize I need to finish. Um, uh, very lastly, I think it's important to look at um, how foreign companies can compete mm. and which sectors are, um, are kind of the easiest uh, considering all of these innovation policies that we've seen um, and, and, and China's objectives. Definitely, definitely the, the easiest sectors are um, non-state and enterprise IT. So, so, for example, dealing with Chinese software companies uh, outside the state and enterprise area. Automation, robotics, very hot 
pharma, medical devices, uh, really hot and with a very strong preference for foreign brands in the hospitals. Um, a little bit harder based on regulation and, um, uh, and, and making it jumping through government hoops is around uh, railway, uh, energy saving, new energy vehicles, new materials, this sort of thing. And then originally I did think that these three are kind of the slowest areas, but in fact, actually after working in New Zealand, uh, you know, I've seen that agriculture is actually a really hot area for foreign companies to get involved in China. Um, because China is, the government is hoping to be able to export some of its environmental impact into other countries. So logging, intensive farming, all that kind of stuff. Um, there is definitely a premium available to foreign companies if, um, yeah, uh, available if uh, they can deliver something more sustainable. Um, and, and the one piece of advice I give to any foreign company going to China is, uh, if they don't need whatever you're offering, they're not going to buy it. So if it's kind of soft or, or not required, then um, you, you need to think about what part of value proposition it is that you have that is absolutely core, irreplaceable, uncopyable. That's what they're going to be interested in. Finally, a conclusion, and after this I promise it's finished, um, is you know going back to our original question of how will China build a world-beating economy, um, it's all about balance. It's all about balancing regional stakeholders with uh, companies, um, different companies between each other. It's about, um, uh, uh, you know, balancing the environment with, with, with growth. It's balancing rural migration with urban populations. Um, and it's a very difficult equation to get right and, and something that, you know, uh, we're going to see uh, China's central leadership struggle with, you know, for many more years. So that's pretty much it. Um, uh, thank you for listening. Any questions? You know, happy to happy to take them. And uh, apologies for rushing through that so quickly at the end. Well, thanks so very much, Paul. And that that's a fascinating talk. Uh, the now the the uh, line is open. Now we'll often say the floor is open. Now the line is open. Um, any questions from our audience? nobody all right um if so can i can i have a question uh paul please Go ahead. uh on your logo you actually you have um victoria university of wellington yes really i taught there for four years oh fantastic that, that was my university so <laughs> you're tony <laughs> brown world, yeah uh, do you have to the end of the world, but ne never mind. You know, we're we're basically a uh, connection. So my question is this: with the current development, which is a sharp yield term from many countries, including India, including South you know, uh, Africa, including of course the United States, um, countries start to turn back to China and they basically, uh, after shaking hands with China, they count their fingers, so, so to speak. So, so in that kind of context, do you think we can still do business as you suggest? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a tricky one, right? Um, I think um, this, um this this diagram kind of explains uh which areas are going to be easier and which areas are a bit harder mm. but um absolutely there's always going to be a market china is not going to uh, all of a sudden you know close its doors to foreign players and i think it's foolish to um to, to be so nationalistic that 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 foreign companies would would shut out uh, China based on kind of these 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 um, diplomatic spats. It's 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 really unfortunate, and, and I'm sure it's justified in in, in certain sectors. Um, hopefully, it will change. But uh, I'd say you know this this kind of gives you an idea of where it's easier and where it's going to be harder to compete. Um, and I'm hoping that. 
uh, you know, it's never been easy, right? Like it's always been hard and you've always needed to, to invest a lot if you want to go to China, but the upside is enormous if you're successful. Um, so I, I, you know, personally, I hope that this continues and, 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 and that businesses, you know, the businesses always tend to kind of manage regardless of politics anyway, you know, even in the eighties when, when Nike was opening up in China, um, it, you know, money kind of, it talks louder than, than than politics for a lot of these companies, and I kind of hope that that, that continues as well. Good. Um, any questions from our audience, please? Professor Deng, I think it's Martina here. I think we have a couple of uh, questions in the group chats. Uh, yeah. One was actually written. I've reported it because it was actually sent um, to me. Uh, from one of our current students. Unfortunately, unfortunately, she couldn't attend, so uh, she sent me the question to ask to Paul. And after that, I see also another couple of questions, uh, from, one from Charlie and one from uh, Bernard as well. If you want to okay. leave that, Paul. Can we start with Charlie, please? Is Charlie there? Is Charlie there? Yes. Go on, go on. Charlie, go on, you're, you're online. Okay, great. So we're wondering whether um, you see that state-owned enterprises or state-linked enterprises are more susceptible susceptible to corruption. Ah, oh, um, they back in the day definitely. Now probably not. Um, the penalties for uh, corruption are so severe uh, that it's it's it's. Uh, I wouldn't say it's been stamped out, um, but it's. Um, you know, far less than it, it used to be. And, you know, the, the impact that it will have on not only an official who engages in corruption, but the network around that official um, is, is so, so severe that, that um, there is there's much less these days. Uh, and, and I, you know, I expect that to, to continue as well. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Good, uh, who's next? Martina, who is next? I see the next question, uh, Paul, is actually in the chat. Uh, it's been sent to me by one of our um, current students. Um, let me just get it back to you. Um, you should be able to see it in the chat. Anyway, uh, Anne is asking, uh, in recent times, we have seen China uh, ramp up its soft power efforts and investment in multilateralism through increased involvement in bodies such as UNESCO. How do you see China's soft power cultural relations strategies, behavior and actions adapting to address changing perceptions of China around the world due to COVID-19? Thank you. Okay, okay. That's a big one. Um, okay, so, so soft power and COVID. Um, soft power, I, I think it's fair to say that, um, you know, the, the, the party has probably done a pretty miserable job when it comes to soft power uh, over the last sort of three or four years. Um, and, and particularly so when you look at um, uh, relations with Europe and, and, uh, and with, uh, with the US, um, which, is, which is a shame when there's kind of so much uh, potential there. Uh, it's not helped, of course, by, uh, by you know, sort of populist leaders um, uh, around the world, uh, except in you know, certain countries where uh, populism is in fact benefited by a good relationship with the, uh, with the party. Uh, but generally, you know, it's, I'd say UNESCO is, you know, UNESCO is doing a great job with regards to uh, promoting you know, like the, the tourist sites and the beautiful areas of China that, that are there to be visited. Um, uh, but the the party as a whole, I'd say, has not not done a great job with soft power. Um, and uh, and then, uh, of course, you know, I'm not I'm not saying anything about the Confucius Institute there. I think the Confucius Institute does a, does a marvelous job of, of reaching out, even if it's slightly unfairly maligned in in a lot of situations. Um, which again is you know part of soft power. With regards to COVID, oh, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Um, I mean, China itself has, 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 has had to deal with its own uh, issues internally with, with COVID and has come out quite well. Uh, there's definitely, uh, again, with the soft power, not, not, you know, it's not managing its hubris well, right? It's, uh, 
um, it, it, it's uh, the, 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 the message that we're getting here in the West is, is kind of um, one of, well, we told you so, right? Uh, rather than mutual support, um, which is again, unfair considering there are elements within the country that are, are, are putting a lot of effort into making sure that masks are available in other countries and supporting other countries. Um, I'd say it's, a, do you know what? Honestly, with all this stuff, it's a question of, of PR. I think, I think the government acts, it, the Chinese government acts in, in, in a very beneficial way abroad, but I think its messaging is uh, not, not as good as it could be or not as good as it should be, to, to, to be completely honest. And I may have people disagree with me, uh, but this is my opinion. Uh, more questions from the audience, please. New message. Uh, let me see. This is from uh, Frankie. Is Frankie there? Frankie. Yes, here. Uh, go ahead, please. You know, why don't you just raise your raise your hand and and you know give a go? Thank you. Sure. Um, so yeah, I recently read an article. Um, and it was written by an American journalist who's just started with uh, CCTV, the national uh, media company. And he basically was saying how rare it was for a foreigner to work for a state-owned enterprise. Um, do you think this will remain the case? Or do you think that it will become more, there'll be more foreigners working for these sort of companies as time progresses? Yeah, so, uh, you know, back living in Shanghai, um, it was always fun when you, you had that one friend who, who works for, uh, one of the the, the state-owned companies. Uh, typically, what you see with 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 um, foreigners, particularly uh, kind of Westerners working in state-owned companies, is um, uh, two areas where they where they work. Number one is uh, in the media. So, for example, like uh, the journalist uh, you're describing, who worked for um, CCTV uh, as either presenters or copy editors. Um, within you know uh, within those enterprises um and there will always be a requirement uh for uh you know foreigners to join those companies whether that will grow is kind of down to how the the government changes its um messaging or you know its emphasis on 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 on, on messaging abroad uh on its soft power um I expect it will increase and I expect you'll see foreigners, not particularly from the West, but, but areas of the Belt and Road Initiative. So Central Asia, uh, Africa, um, you know, Latin America, you'll see, you'll see people from, from those areas um, getting, getting employed there and you'll see that growing. Uh, the other side of state enterprise where you see foreigners working is typically, um, so if I go back to this diagram here, right? So under the state's own companies, uh, you'll see there's a holding group, then there are subsidiaries which are listed, and then finally at the bottom you see minority subsidies, uh, subsidiaries, sorry, and uh, joint ventures. So uh, what you find is um, at these joint ventures, uh, typically these are joint ventures either between state-owned and privately held uh, in China, or um, state-owned and foreign companies in China, particularly in like the automotive sector where you see uh, Peugeot, Nissan, um, Toyota, whoever forming these these joint companies, um, and and you know there's always a fresh cycle of um, of of, of uh, foreign foreigners who join these companies to uh, kind of as as experts expert engineers to to bring bring that um, that that expertise from their own uh, companies or their own countries to to these state owned enterprises. Um, one trend, you know, I think you bang on the money. One one trend that's really going to be interesting to see is um, firstly is there going to be an increase in demand for uh, state and enterprises to bring these foreign experts in in line with the, the policies for the I think it's called like the golden expert visa or something that China released um, a little while ago and and on the other hand you've got the foreign companies who are posting these guys abroad um, you know do they you know, are they are they afraid that their IP is going to be um, taken from, you know, their know-how from these these people, uh, or or are they confident that the market opportunity is so big that a little bit of IP leakage is, is not really an issue? Um, you know, you're going to see, uh, I, I don't know, honestly, um, uh, probably a decline in the immediate future, and then 
I think once you know Trump is out of power and you know, fingers crossed Trump is out of power and things start to return to normal, um, hopefully this this will start to resume again. But you know, we're going to see. Good. Um, how are we doing with time, Martina? I think we are uh, pretty much towards the end. The end. Oh, I don't know if anyone has uh, any other questions. I don't see anyone raising their hands or writing in the group. I'd like to take one more question from the audience. Surely we have 20 people, more than 20, yeah? Any question, please, from the audience? Thank you. Any question? Any at all? Okay, yeah, I have another question. Please. Um, I was wondering, in, again, in relation to corruption, um, how would you see uh, China's policies in terms of uh, its foreign direct investment? Like, do they have like this same strict anti-corruption rules for their foreign uh, direct investment in amongst Africa or Asia or countries that are more, I don't know, like more susceptible again to corruption? Yeah, good point. Okay. So the outbound, um, the outbound market, really, like the outbound FDI. Uh, yeah, I think that's definitely something that um, uh, that 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 people fear. Um, I have not the faintest idea how much corruption is taking place outside i imagine uh you know that there, there, there will be some and i imagine the ability of the organization department here to catch it is uh, distinctly reduced outside of the borders um i imagine the penalties are the same but yeah complete um you know a complete guess really uh would be that um uh, probably more than is happening within the country, uh, but but that the penalties remain if if they're found out. Um, you know, it's a it's a really good point. Yeah, because you could in a way argue if they if they want to go against corruption to increase productivity, it's it's less of an issue, productivity issue, when doing business abroad, and it can maybe even help to 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 use the corrupt sort of like <laughs> means to get there, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a great business practice. It sets a precedent, right? Um, and, uh, and, and it's a precedent that, that um, leaves a poor taste in the mouth of, um, of the, pop, you know, the population of the country that you're trying to do business with. I mean, for sure, the market, the outbound market, the outbound FDI market for the government is, um, you know, is frankly tiny compared to, to its domestic market. Um, uh, but I mean, my guess is that there will be some, in, like you say, to oil the wheels a little bit uh, and to adapt to the local cultures. Um, but I would say it's, it's not, it's, you know, it's definitely not an official policy and um, it, it, it would never be promoted as such and definitely frowned upon, uh, at least officially frowned upon. Okay, thanks. My pleasure. All right, I think we almost run out of time. Um, I'm uh expected to to uh, draw a conclusion yeah first of all thank you so very much for paul's excellent presentation and uh, systematic and in-depth um knowledge about china this is a difficult time after 20 30 years of reforms we think we know china but all of a sudden all of a sudden china becomes so remote yeah, it's almost like unknown again. So in that regard, we need people like Paul to tell us more about the secret of doing pieces with China. Yeah, more than ever, right? More than ever. So uh, let's thank Paul for his input um, today. And I, I hope our dialogue and our, our conversation continues whatever happens to China and what happen, whatever happens in the UK or in the G7, whatever, yeah? So we still need to understand the mutual con con compatibility of us as one party and China as the other, right? Thank you so very much. Keep safe, keep safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.